So a few months ago, I published a video about film emulation presets and profiles for Adobe Lightroom and Camera Raw made by really nice images. Well, good news for photographers who use Capture One because all of those same film emulation profiles that I covered before are now available for Capture One. If names like Tri-X, Ektar, Portra, Velvia, if all these things are things that you're into, if you, if you enjoy film and the history of film and the differences between all these different types of film, then I hope you enjoy this video today. So let's get going. Good to see you, glad you're here. My name is Todd. I make videos here on YouTube about photography. Okay, before we get going, uh, quick disclaimer, really nice images did provide me for demonstration purposes, all of the film emulation styles that I'm going to be demonstrating here for you today. However, they have not paid for this video. They have not sponsored this video. I do not have any business relationship with really nice images. I'm actually a paying customer because I paid for their film emulation presets and profiles for Adobe Lightroom because I think they're high quality. I think they're well made and I, and I think you get um, really good results with them. And I think they're just a, a good value for the money if you are looking for uh, film emulation as part of your photography. Okay, so here we are in Capture One 21 Pro, and we're going to begin by coming over here to the Adjustments menu, which is where all the styles and presets for Capture One are stored. Now, if you don't know the difference between a preset and a style in Capture One, a preset is a saved value for a particular tool. For example, you can have a preset for grain, for sharpening, for tone curve. It just does one thing, whereas a style is a collection of saved values. So a style in Capture One is basically the same as a preset in Lightroom. Now you'll notice here there are four collections, Fujifilm, JPEG, Nikon and Sony, and Standard. Each one of these folders contains the exact same number of film emulations. These are just different versions of those film emulations. JPEG is somewhat self-explanatory, I think. Those are lighter versions of the, of the styles that are intended to be used with JPEGs, whereas Fujifilm, Nikon and Sony and Standard are designed to be used with raw images. So what's the difference? Why are there three different styles here for different uh, camera manufacturers? Well, the reason being is because of differences with how Capture One interprets raw data from these cameras. The way in which it interprets raw from a Fuji camera is different from how it interprets raw from a Nikon or a Sony camera or a Canon camera or otherwise. According to Really Nice Images, they found that they there was always something more that needed to be done with a Fuji RAW file or a Nikon or a Sony in order to make that particular RAW image uh, appear more similar to the intended uh, emulation or to make it appear more like the, the film stock that is being emulated. So as much as they wanted to have a single collection of styles that could be used across the board, it was better to break them out to get uh, better results for whichever type of camera you're shooting with. All right, so here we have a raw image that was captured uh, using a Canon 5D Mark IV DSLR in Tulum, Mexico. And this means that I need to use the standard styles over here. So inside standard, we have black and white, infrared, instant, negative, slide, and vintage. And then there are grainy versions of each. Now grainy obviously means that grain has been added, like film grain, in order to emulate the grain that you would see if this was shot using actual film, whereas the other ones are clean, so to speak. They don't contain any grain. If we open up black and white, you can see we have more options for 25, 50, 75, and 100%. These are um, relative strengths of the style. Okay, so let's dive in here and take a look. So at the beginning, we have Agfa Scala. I think it's how you pronounce it. Um, I'm probably butchering it. Ilford Delta followed by Ilford FP4, HP5, Tri-X. I mean, if you have ever shot black and white film, I'm sure you will probably recognize a number of these. And with pretty much every film emulation, there is a baseline general, just kind of standard version of it. And then they include variants as well. So for example, this is a, a variant that is faded, almost like you printed the image, you put it on a wall and just sat there for decades and it, <laughs> and it just kind of, uh, well, faded out with time. I love some of these faded emulations in here, by the way. Some of these are just really, really beautiful. If you like that film fade, Man, I mean, there are some in here which are really pretty that we're going to get to. I 
let's move on from black and white and take a look. Oh, by the way, let me just quickly jump in here to grainy. So let's take a look at, let's just do, I don't know, like Tri-X. And then we're going to zoom in here and take a look. So this is Tri-X 200 here with no grain at all. This is the clean version. And then this is Tri-X 200 with grain. Every film has different grain response. Like in other words, what the, the size and the roughness of the grain is, is unique to that particular film. So when you see grainy and when you go in and you check these different um, film stocks out, you're going to see different intensities of grain. It's not just one size fits all for everything. Now, one thing I want to quickly point out is that when you apply one of these film emulation styles from really nice images, you can come over here to the exposure panel and you will see that none of these uh, settings have been changed, right? I mean, none of the exposure values have changed. None of the curves have changed. Nothing is happening inside of uh, the color area either. And the reason this is, is because when these styles are applied, they are using ICC profiles. They're using custom ICC profiles instead of the ICC profile for your camera. This is actually very similar to how profiles work in Adobe Lightroom, where you can assign the style as a baseline profile for the raw conversion that happens when that raw image is imported. And then you have the opportunity to go into exposure or go into color and to be fine tuning um, the results that you're getting. So you apply that style as like a baseline grade, so to speak, and then you're able to make edits on top of that. One quick important thing that I wanna point out is that if you are shooting with a Fuji camera, if you notice when I'm mousing over the styles here, nothing is changing, nothing's happening. The reason that is, is because there's something about Fuji. I don't know if this is like a, uh, what's going on with Capture One. You need to change this to film standard. And then when you change it to film standard, go back, then you're able to apply these, uh, these Fujifilm styles to the image. So just something to be aware of if you are shooting Fuji. All right, so let's move on because I don't wanna uh, bore you just by looking at the same image all the time. Let's pick something else in here. Uh, let's do this one actually from uh, Venice because it has some nice greens in it that we can be using. Every time I see this image, I just think to myself, why didn't you back up? a foot or two, just a little bit more, just to give a little more breathing room to the image because I don't know, maybe I was in a place where I couldn't do it um, standing on a bridge or something, I, I don't remember. But it drives me crazy because oftentimes, you know, the, the impulse is there to try to reduce and to try to remove extraneous things, unnecessary things, distracting things from an image and you're trying to kind of like tighten your composition in. And I think sometimes what happens is that you end up tightening it too much and then later in post, if you need to crop or straighten or something like that, then it just continually just keeps getting tighter. Whereas the better approach would have been standing back just a little bit more, capturing more of the scene because you know in your mind, like if you could pre-visualize it, that you know that at some point you're, later, you're probably going to end up cropping it or straightening it or something like that. And you need to add a little breathing room around the image to accommodate. But in this instance, I did not do that. I make this mistake all the time. And I see it all the time in my photography and it makes me crazy. So anyway, some negative films, Agfa Optimo. Now again, Agfa, right? I mean, I talked about Agfa earlier. I don't know a lot about these Optima films. I guess it was a pretty popular film. Uh, so that's a uh, box speed of 200. Then we have Faded. Faded, oh yeah. Faded looks always so good. Uh, let's just keep going on down here. We're gonna get to Agfa Vista. Don't know a lot about Vista. I would assume that's more landscape oriented, just, you know, richer, more saturated colors. Fuji Natura, don't know a lot about Natura. And then we get to Fuji Pro 160 NS. Yes, so the Fuji Pro emulations, Fuji's obviously been in the news recently. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. I happen to like 160 a lot. I think 160 is, is one of the, the nicer ones. So you have 160 NS. And then the faded, and again, man, the faded just looks so good. Um, let's see, 160 NS V2, v, uh, V2 high contrast. And then we get to Fuji Pro 400H. Now, another very classic professional film stock, especially popular with wedding photographers. This is the film that's been in the news recently because Fuji recently discontinued Fuji Pro 400H. And the reason they did it is apparently because they can't get the, uh, like there's a particular chemical or something that they need in order to produce the film. And apparently it's no longer available. And so they can't make any more 
Fuji Pro 400H. So you're probably gonna start seeing boxes of it going for pretty expensive on eBay. It just, they just all have like that Fuji kind of look. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just, if you like that look, it means you don't have to shoot with a Fuji camera and use their in-camera emulations that they have for JPEGs. You can shoot with anything and, um, and convert them using emulation. Let's move on for Fuji, and now we get to Kodak Ektar. Now, Ektar is almost like slide film. It has a punchier contrast, punchier uh, saturation, more richly saturated colors. Kodak Gold 200. Now, Gold 200, I mean, Gold was, um, I think they're still making it actually. Gold is similar to Fuji Superior in that it was considered to be a consumer film, not a professional film. It's the kind of film that your mom or dad probably went out and bought a box of and shot a bunch of family uh, photos with because it was cheaper and, you know, it produced good results. Actually, I don't think this is, this is like a very appropriate Fuji image here with these greens and the whites. Um, actually, this is perfect for this. So this is also in Venice. And I have to tell you, when I was in Venice, I mean, there were so many people there. I was just looking for any quiet space, any place where I could get away. And, um, and I just liked, um, I just enjoyed focusing on like the quiet areas because there are very few. It's like a topic for a whole nother day. Venice is an interesting place. Okay, deep breath. Now we are getting to Kodak Portra. Now Portra, of course, is a classic. Kodak Portra has been around a long time. I'm sure Kodak probably sells a fair number of boxes of Kodak Portra today because it's probably more popular than ever before. I mean, because, you know, like Instagram filters are based on it. Lots of presets have copied it. There's something about it because it is a portrait film, professional portrait film, as indicated by its name. It uh, It's a softer, more pastel film. It pulls out some of that color, some of that saturation, especially some of the reds and the um, and the magentas. When it comes to skin tone, it just gets a, mm, it just has a very luminous look to it that a lot of people like and uh, is, is very fashionable. All right, so let's move on and take a look at some slide emulations. I picked this image here from Costa Rica because it has uh, some, some nice color to work with. Let's go into slide. Now, slide film in general, in case you don't know, slide film is harder contrast, uh, just deeper, more saturated colors in general compared to negative film. All right, so as I promised earlier, I wanna go back up here and take a look at uh, infrared and instant. Let's begin with infrared. And this image really isn't appropriate for it. So let me find something that has some green in it. Actually both, uh, well, let's try something here. So I'm gonna select this and then I'm going to command select the other one and check this out. So this is one of the cool things about Capture One. This is one of the things I really like about using the software is that you can put up multiple images at the same time on screen and be developing them together. And, you know, instead of the, the Lightroom way of it being kind of separate, not being able to see your changes that are being synced, here you can put up two, three, four, however many you want. As you may know, if you follow my channel, I actually went down a deep, dark rabbit hole on Kodak Aerochrome. And, uh, and I made two videos about it, actually, about the history of Aerochrome and about, um, and I tried to emulate Aerochrome shooting actual infrared and using these film emulations in Lightroom. Anyway, those are two separate videos. If you're into Aerochrome, if you want to know more, know more about the history of it, I will link to those videos up here and below. All right, so let's check out some of the instant films. Now, instant film, of course, you know, invented by 
uh, Edwin Land and Polaroid, and then other companies picked it up. And there's some Polaroids down here that we're going to get to here in a minute. All right, so now we've taken a look at uh, Instant, and uh, and then of course there are the grainy versions in here too, if you want some of that film grain. Long video, right? So let's get on to Vintage. Now, I don't know, maybe we should uh, mix things up here a little bit. Um, okay, so Vintage. So Vintage is more like early 20th century film emulation. So you have Agfa colors from the 40s, from the 50s, from the 60s, and so on. And oftentimes what happens, the reason there are different decades here is because companies would change the formula. They would change the appearance of it, which oftentimes affected like pop culture and affected like your memory of a particular deck of a particular decade can sometimes be influenced by whatever the film stock was from that decade, which is kind of interesting to think about, right? All right, I hope you enjoyed the video. I realize this has probably gone on for a very long time. If you made it this far, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and attention. Um, I've probably rambled on quite a bit. One of the things that I just wanna quickly point out, and this is perhaps just a really obvious thing to say, but I think it, it, it's worth mentioning that at the end of the day, there is no substitute for actual film, right? There is something just inherently kind of romantic and fantastic and wonderful about the unpredictable nature of film, about the inherent characteristics and personality of it, which do not exist in a very clinical, precise, accurate um, world of digital photography that we live in now. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like a band doing a cover version of an original song. Like it's not exactly the same as the original. No, like no matter how hard they try. But where I think these film emulations are wonderful are, well, one, the cost savings. You don't have to buy film, develop film, because it is very expensive. You can emulate the look if there's a particular look you're going for. I think if you're working on a particular project, like an ad campaign or something um, something of that nature, or, or like a collection of travel images, perhaps you're uh, working for, um, you work in media, you're publishing images through magazine, newspapers, whatever, and you're trying to emulate that film look. This is a really uh, cost-effective way in order to be doing it. They are so much fun just to go through and explore and learn from and experiment with. By the way, in case you don't know, there is a free demo available of these styles from Really Nice Images for Capture One. It doesn't include all of the styles, of course. It's just a, a small subset of them. But you can absolutely go over, download them, check them out, give them a try, and see how you like them. I'll leave a link down below so you can check it out. Thank you, of course, to Really Nice Images for providing me with the styles for Capture One. And as for you, if you enjoyed this video, if you learned something from it, if you enjoyed listening to me ramble on about film photography for a while and film emulation, please uh, do me a favor and like this video. Give it a thumbs up below. It will help expose the video to more people, more people, more Capture One users, more film enthusiasts, and just bring more people to my channel in general. So would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you next time.